those leaves, what do they make up? What do those leaves make up? What's made up of leaves? Canopies. Canopies are made of leaves. At the top of the woods, at the top of the trees, you'll see a whole bunch of leaves. I just get so emotional sometimes. I know I don't seem like an emotional guy. But when I sing about trees and leaves and canopies, if I cried, I would wipe away a tear. I'm glad you're all here. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. We have a very interesting topic tonight and I, I decided instead of uh, instead of just doing a normal you know a one-off where we cover a, a particular topic I thought you know what let's start a series now the last series I did was the inktober series which ended in disaster when I attempted to draw Callie Kim with a ballpoint pen and she ended up looking like uh, the, the Wild Witch of the West. And um, it just, that was, that was it. The series ended at that point. John Kohler was fine. Callie Kim was not. I, I, still, um, I still have some regret there. <clears throat> but what we are going to do is actually do a series on food forest because it's one of my favorite topics and I've been doing more and more research and experimentation over the years. I just can't stop with the food forest thing. But my, my thinking on it has evolved over time significantly as I've tested and experimented and walked through more woods. <laughs> so uh, as, I'm, as I'm doing research and writing on various species again for uh, for the revised, expanded, and illustrated version of Create Your Own Florida Food Forest. Um, I am, you know, putting together illustrations and getting artists and all this this cool stuff going on. But it's it's got me back thinking about the trees again. And in the tropical food forest that I'm working on, there's a different set of trees than I worked with in Tennessee and a different set of trees than I worked with in South Florida, and a different set of trees that I worked with in North Florida. Plus, I'm always getting questions from people in various extreme circumstances, like, hey, I live at 8,000 feet in the arid desert. What trees would you recommend for a food forest? Somebody actually asked me that. Fruit trees for the high desert. And I, I called local experts in her area and interviewed them and wrote up an article and gave links to all the people that I did. I was like, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I'm just going to play journalist here. Uh, well, <laughs> journalists now, most journalists are not journalists. But I'll play journalist and, uh, and, and you know, do some actual journalism where, you know, you hunt down, hunt down sources, interview them, and, and just find out what the truth is. So that's what... I decided to do for this lady and it made a very good article which I should post for you guys but I don't feel like it. So today we're going to talk about the canopy and the canopy obviously is the top part, the top part of the forest, the canopy, right? Like the canopy umbrella, it's the top, the very very top and I will answer at uh, all super chats at the end of this presentation, so I don't um, gum it up. But feel free to drop a super chat or drop a question. I'll definitely I'll answer the super chats first, and if we have time, I'll try to go through the rest of the the thread and answer any any questions. And uh, I see. Thank you very much to Cactus Eater Bear for the first super chat there. Yes, <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. That's funny. All right. Um, 
I will answer one that, that one at the end because that's that's a very good question. <clears throat> so today we will talk about food forest design part one, and what we'll do over the next week or two is we'll go through the different parts of the food forest, and and I'll share some of my ideas and hopefully give you guys ideas for your your climates, your designs, your backyards, your whatever you're working on. Um, some of you have a lot of space and some of you have a little, so I'll cover both larger spaces and smaller spaces. So we'll have uh, a lot there. But I want to start with an illustration for those of you that are new to Food Forest from, from one of my favorite bloggers. Now, I totally just ripped off this image from his site, but he put his link on it. And I have linked to this guy a bunch because I think he is one of the best resources for temperate climate permaculture. What? He calls himself temperate climate permaculture. What a coincidence. <laughs> Crazy. So, tcpermaculture.com has this excellent illustration on the nine layers of the edible forest garden, also known as a food forest. And as you can see, layer number one is the canopy slash tall tree layer. Two is the subcanopy slash large shrub layer. So this could be small trees, large shrubs. Three is the shrub layer. This would be your, your smaller things, maybe your um, maybe your 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 smaller woody plants, uh, gooseberries, thornless blackberries, maybe nanking cherries. It really depends on the size of your system. And and these layers are somewhat fluid. <clears throat> and then four is the herbaceous layer, and that is your your herbs that might be um, where you put your your comfrey, your uh, lemon balm, you know horseradish. Horseradish is one I really really like. I can't I can't grow it where I am, but I used to love growing it in Tennessee. A really cool plant. And then you have your ground cover slash creeper layer down on the ground. And then he adds in the underground layer. That's the the root layer. So you might have root crops in there. And then he puts in the vertical slash climber layer. And, the, and then he adds in the aquatic and wetland layer, and nine, the mycelial or fungal layer. I don't really bother with trying to design a fungal layer. Most of the time, I don't have a wetland layer. And at number six, the underground layer, I just usually count that as part of my, my perennial shrubs or herbs. If they happen to make roots beneath the ground, I don't really count it as a layer. There is a layer down there, and as a matter of fact, beneath the ground, your food forest can often go almost as deep as it does above the ground, but it's it's not that important. And in a tropical climate, you usually have your canopy tall tree layer, your sub canopy, your shrubs, your, your herbaceous layer, your ground cover layer, and then you have a vine layer and a palm layer. The palms are the ones that just kind of pop through here and there and they will go way over the top and they don't really shade everything nearly so much as regular trees do. They have a big tuft at the top and sometimes I've seen areas of forest where the palms are, are going up and through and an incredible, like, just, just bang, they just came out of this layer. What? Oh, and look at my hands, see? I'm just gonna make this disappear here. So you've got, here, here's the layer of the top canopy and then there are palms like popping out through and up above and they don't really cast a lot of shade and as as the as the day goes by and the water rushing under they uh the light coming through is not that big a deal it's it's you know it's shading different parts and when you have the tropics it doesn't matter if you cut the light down you can actually grow a ton with with less light than you think so in the food forest layers obviously the canopy there at the top that's what we're going to talk about today the canopy layer is in 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 my food forest design the canopy layer is what i plant first the canopy layer these that's the pegs that the tent that's the the poles i should say the, the pegs would be in the ground but the the poles that the tent is hanging from so your canopy there is that that top space and then you know you get your sub canopy around it and your shrubs around it i look at it as i've as i did in a previous uh good stream which i really enjoyed my island method of building a food forest is to start with the canopy trees 
and then build around those canopy trees and make pathways in between. So you've got an island or a guild where you have your canopy trees, some of your sub canopy trees, some of your shrubs, some of your herbs, and then you move over past a pathway, maybe some grass, maybe some mulch, whatever. And then you've got your next island, which has that canopy tree in the middle. Uh, but the thing about food forests that drives the neurotic planner crazy is that they are dynamic and living systems. And what they look like at the beginning is not anything what they look like at the, at the ending or towards maturity of the system. <clears throat> it's nuts. So this is a big problem. When I, when I went through the Master Gardener program in uh, Marion County, Florida, I met some very nice people. And uh, they had a lot on, on, on landscaping. And one of the things they mentioned in landscaping, we had, to do, we had to do some landscape design. One of the things they talked about in landscaping is, remember the mature height of something before you plant it. And they showed, this guy had some photos of where they had done work on a roadside and they had planted in like three palm trees. When they put them in from the pots, they looked really good, three little palm trees. And then he says, here it is eight years later and the palms are just kind of like crammed into the space and they look really weird. And he, he says, okay, you know, look at this hedge. You plant all this stuff like, hey man, it, it kind of fills in real nice. This hedge already looks good. You know, you take it out of the pot, it's this tall, you stick it in the ground, you put the other one right here, you put the other one right here. That looks great. No, don't do that. That's not the way it works. They're gonna get big and they're gonna fight with each other. And if you plant your canopy trees, too close, there's gonna, there's gonna be nothing else. Nothing's gonna be able to live under underneath that canopy because it's going to completely close the entire system off. So when I plan a food forest system, I, I think, okay, well, if it's a tree that's expensive that I had to pay for rather than grafting or propagating myself, I treat it much more carefully than something that I decided to start myself. I, I believe in making a little nursery in your backyard. I believe in propagating your own plants and forgetting things for next to nothing. But there are times when you say, look at, I'm just gonna go and buy some pecan trees. And those pecan trees might be 40 bucks a tree. You gotta go get some grafted pecans and put them in, I'm gonna go buy them. So you do. If you go and you plant those pecan trees at 12 feet apart, man, those are too close. Which are way too close. Uh, that's not going to be happy pecans. They're going to run into each other. And if you had propagated them yourselves and you just stuck pecan trees all over the place and then later you figured, hey, whichever ones don't look so good, I'm going to chop them down and I'll feed them to the other trees. That's different. If you, if you, did, if you planted your pecan trees by buying a bag of pecans, soaking them overnight, putting them in the refrigerator until, you know, for four or five months and then planting them and get them to sprout all over your yard and then you just let them grow and you start taking out the ones that don't look so hot later on. Eh, that one's a little shrimpy. Eh, I don't like that one. You know, then it's no big deal. But if you paid 40 bucks a tree, by golly, you better make sure you give them really good spacing right from the beginning because you've got an investment in there that, uh, that you're, you're not going to recoup, you know. Uh, it's pain. <clears throat> so, you pace it off, you figure, okay, I, this tree is, it's a big tree, it's going to get big, this is not a tree that's easy to prune or control or anything else, we're just going to count on this becoming a tree that's 60, 70, maybe 80 feet tall in, in 20, 30, 40 years or whatever. So, you walk 60 feet and you plant one pecan and you plant another pecan and you're looking, you're like, that's a lot of empty space in between, what do I do now? Well, that's where you start to fill in with your subcanopy and your, your ground covers and your herbaceous layers and all that stuff, which is why I, I recommend the, the island approach. Um, <clears throat> so, if you've got, don't start fighting in the chat, everybody, for goodness sakes, just... Don't, don't start it again. 
don't start it again. I am going to give somebody, I'm going to give somebody administrator privileges. And you can just, you can just go nuts. Let me see here. <laughs> if you guys, uh, here you go, Ev, you're a moderator now. <laughs> if anybody gets weird, just, just nuke it. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to get into it. I appreciate you guys, but don't get, don't get me in trouble here. All right. So when you've got these things like 60 feet apart and you're looking at them, you're going, uh, man alive, there's a lot of grass in between there. It feels wrong. So what are you going to do? Go out and buy a bazillion things to put in between or, or get in there? You know, um, <clears throat> the, the thing that I recommend doing is to improve the ground as much as possible around those canopy trees first. Those are the poles, the poles that are going to hold up the tent. Get them to grow as fast and as happy as possible and plant some of your sub canopy trees around them. But know, know that those trees eventually are going to get very big. So some of that sub canopy stuff might get run over later. So I, I recommend planting shorter lived sub canopy trees unless you're going to plant them farther out. So if you had your two pecans at 60 feet, you could easily put an apple in the middle at the 30 foot, you know, from, from either trunk or put a couple, you know, an apple and a pear at maybe the 20 and the 20. But at some point, if you've got pecans here and then maybe you put another couple of pecans here, that area is going to start to get really shaded over and you may lose that middle to a certain extent. So sometimes it even makes sense to say, okay, well, if my canopy is going to be touching at 60 feet, maybe that's commercial spacing, I might go 80 feet. And then I know that I've got this gap in between where I can stick stuff. And that, that I could put a sub canopy kind of in between. Some of those really big trees uh, are, are going to creep up on you. <clears throat> and eventually it's gonna be like, oh shoot. Oh shoot. That thing's too big. And now the apple isn't fruiting anymore. So you have a, you, you can, at that point you can maybe get up there and prune it, but trying to prune like a 60 foot pecan or something, it's tough. So keep this in mind when you're building the canopy, what that canopy may eventually do. Uh, you know, when I, when I first got into the food forest system and I, I, I watched Jeff Lawton's establishing a food forest, the permaculture way, multiple times, and I read um, Martin Crawford's book, I read uh, Eric Tonsmeyer, I, I experimented with different things. I realized pretty quickly in a temperate climate, I was in, I was in Tennessee, that the amount of sunshine that you get if you allow your food forest to be too tight, the, the canopy will choke everything out. You're actually better off almost with a strip rather than a full on forest. If you let it go like Appalachian Trail in there, there's a point where everything is just all touching high above and then there's just this nice shady area underneath, you know, and it's just, maybe a few creepers and a ginseng if you're lucky. And it's this, this really quiet, damp space. And then far above, there's the treetops. There's the canopy. But there's not really any food that you can actually reach. You gotta kinda hope that it falls. Stuff falls down to you, you know? So in that sort of a situation, <clears throat> like if I was going into an existing situation with trees like that, I would go around and, and cut down like every third tree in the system to let, let those clearings come in. If you get a clearing where the light comes in, you suddenly get a whole bunch of new activity and a whole bunch of potential for smaller trees, shrubs, herbs, even back to annuals. But that mature canopy system really will just, it can just suppress absolutely everything. Yes, pruning, definitely. <clears throat> oh, Arch, just knock it off, man. I don't understand even what you're talking about. Just, just, just 
Stop. I wrote you an email. I don't, I don't even know. Only, only Alan can speak freely in this space. Whatever. Just, just don't get into the politics and stuff. It's, it's too much. I think you have my phone number. Just call me if something bugs you or, or drop me an email. Um, but I, I honestly get so many uh, comments and everything and, and pressure. This is, this is my life in part. This is my, 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 like, my income, my teaching, my books and everything. A lot of it's tied to YouTube. So I just don't really want it to turn into an endless crazy fist fight. It's a gardening channel. And there's, there's just, there's enough politics and stuff going on already. So just, um, you know, I highly recommend going to zerohedge.com and fighting in the comments over there. But this, this just isn't the place for it. And I, I, I'm not gonna be able to make everybody happy. <clears throat> I don't actually believe in free speech. I'm not allowed to. I'm on YouTube. <laughs> All right. So, the canopy. If that canopy closes, things are done. So, watch that spacing. Don't forget the sun. And maintain the forest edges. The edges of the system are where the really interesting stuff is taking place. As you are walking across the meadow to the edge of the woods, that's where all the creepers are. That's where the birds are. That's where... All of the, you, you, I would often find blackberries like around the edges of the woods. Not always like right out in the open by themselves and not underneath the canopy of the woods, but at the edges. Those edges are where there's two different ecosystems running into each other and that's where the dynamic stuff takes place. This is a common permaculture idea. You know, maintain the edges. The sunshine is really important. And if you can get that morning sun, you know, that's really important. Particularly in southern climes, get the morning sun. The afternoon sun is not that important. In some places, the morning sun is kind of weak and watery, and the, the afternoon sun is better. So if that's your climate, try to design for the afternoon sun. But make sure you know you don't go and plant all of your trees where they're going to you know tall tall stuff where it's going to shade everything else out the rest of the day. You want to curve it. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, you want to make sure you're getting that southern sun and 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 the light is coming in and and you you almost design it like a bowl so you can catch stuff from the high parts the middle parts and the low parts keep those edges running and if things get too nutty sure you know go prune go chop go cut 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 whatever um do whatever you have to to maintain it but obviously if you are dealing with um, you know, your, your expensive trees, just plant it out at the beginning first. I'm, I, like I say, I, I like to let nature plant a system in a lot of ways. I like to put a lot of things in. If I'm going to put a canopy in and I've grown the trees and it cost, cost me like next to nothing, I'll put in more canopy trees and then chop them down and feed them to each other over time. And, and that way, I might put the canopy trees at 20 feet apart and the ones that are really doing well, they win. The ones that I really like, win. But if I had to pay for it, I'm gonna spend more time planning it out and not let nature do as much of it. You know, cause, cause nature will allow the system to take shape. If you just plant a whole ton of stuff, eventually it will develop a canopy, a sub canopy, a shrub layer, vine layer, you know, ground cover layer, etc. until it reaches a certain level of maturity and then it starts to, um, you know, it starts to burn out uh, everything beneath it if the canopy gets too thick. And at that point, you go through with a chainsaw and you knock things around. Don't be afraid. You can fix many problems. Most problems in life can be fixed with a chainsaw. This is true. This is a truism. <laughs> All right, I got to pull something up right here. I have a, um, I have a video that I have to drop into the upload window. 
while I am doing this live stream because I would really like this video to go live later today and I had some technical issues earlier so it's just going to upload in the background and hopefully it doesn't destroy this live stream because I actually have decent internet at the moment. <clears throat> All right, so part of your canopy at the beginning may not just be the stuff that you actually want to keep. Your canopy at the beginning is, is often, if you have planned it correctly, the pioneer species. You know, so your fast growing nitrogen fixers, your, your biomass plants, they, they way outgrow your other trees. So if I were to say plant a mimosa tree, at the same time that I planted a pecan tree, and they were near each other. The mimosa tree, Albizia julibrisin, for those of you that want to know it in Latin, mimosa tree is kind of a flaky name. Albizia julibrisin, all right, that tree will way outgrow the pecan at the beginning. It grows way faster. Or say an interlobium cyclocarpum or crintorsicvium, you know, one of those interlobiums, they grow really, really fast. They might grow six feet in a year, four feet, six feet in a year. Boom! You know, your, your pecan has grown two, year, two feet in the first year. And it's way outpaced by the nitrogen fixers, which is fine. Don't plant the nitrogen fixers too close to it unless you intend on regularly cutting the nitrogen fixers. I like Jeff Lawton's approach to cutting the nitrogen fixers at about six feet. So you kind of have a canopy top of the nitrogen fixers at maybe, you know, your head height. So you can go around and pollard them. They might grow six to eight feet and then you cut that six to eight feet off and feed it to another tree. You know, and then they might grow six to eight feet again the next year and you chop it and you feed it to another tree. So you actually use those nitrogen fixers to put the nitrogen beneath the ground for your canopy trees and also to, you know, shade during the hottest time of the year. If you have a really hot summer, it's really nice to have some of these canopy trees that can shade the system during the worst parts of summer. Don't cut it until the worst part of the heat is over. So the plants get a little bit of a reprieve from the sun. So those nitrogen fixers are fast growers. You might put a bunch of them in at the beginning. And then over time, as your pecan trees start to get bigger, start to move, you know, the top canopy trees, you're cutting those nitrogen fixers more and more. And more and more, they are going to be beneath the canopy rather than the top of the canopy. But at the beginning, the nitrogen fixers are like, shoo! They outpace everything. And that's what they're supposed to do. That's what they were designed to do. They were designed to take poor ground and repair it. So you put a whole bunch of them in, but you know that you're just gonna keep chopping those suckers all the time. They're not your final canopy. They are the canopy for a season, but over time that canopy gets chopped down and, and cut into pieces and fed to the rest of the system. So your final canopy species, if you're say in a tropical climate, you might be growing Mammy Sapoti or mangoes or breadfruit you know there's a lot of different things you can grow that are going to get big and start to fill it in some of these things you may want to keep smaller if you have a smaller yard you might be a really aggressive pruner and just keep knocking things down but some trees are really hard to keep down like melee apple you know or tamarind you can keep it down but man you got to keep on it you got to keep chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping it's it's not easy so you know, if you want to maintain them smaller, you're going to have to work at it. Something like pecans, I don't even know that you can keep them small. You can prune chestnuts, at least the Dunstan chestnut or the Chinese chestnut, and keep them under control. But some things are just holy moly. They, they head for the sky. And you have to remember that. But if you're in a northern climate, you know, you might have some of the edible hickories, shell bark hickory. You know, even pig nut hickory, there's some edible ones. You know, they're not bad. Not easy to harvest. Some of, some, some of those members of that family you've got to watch out for, like the walnuts, uh, particularly black walnut, is really uh, allelopathic. But it's only allelopathic after it hits a certain age. It's usually like the first seven to eight years you can pretty much grow stuff around it. And then at that point it starts to really pump out the juggalone and, and fight with everything around it. And that's not as good. You know, so... You've got to remember that if you're going to put a black walnut in, you pretty much got to put a few black walnuts off in a corner where it's, it's not a problem, you know. Um, 
if you are the the further north you go, sometimes your your edible canopy trees get a little more limited. And in areas where you have like pine dominated forests, pines maybe are it, you know, maybe you could put in some some edible some pines with edible nuts. Some of them have actually pine nuts are quite good. If you can find some of those, that's good. Or find anything edible that you can pack in. But but it gets harder as you go further north. Generally, you kind of got a sweet spot between like zone five to to zone ten or whatever. You know, from from about zone five south, there's a lot of taller, nice taller stuff you can grow. Even like a Kentucky coffee tree. You know, some of those things are the cool trees that you can add into the canopy layer. But or, or, or full-size standard apple trees. That's a nice one. I, I like standard trees. There was a standard apple, old, old apple growing at my great aunt's place in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And that apple tree was beautiful. Great big tree. They didn't take care of it at all. Little, little apples about that big that were very nice. They were just piles of them on the ground every year. Pretty awesome. And, you know, hey, put the, let those apples grow up there. Who cares? Uh, you know, and, and if you're if you're in a tropical enough situation, you can do some cool stuff like throw in a, a macadamia nuts. You know, those are cool. But you you'll have to determine the species according to what grows in your area, and then say how tall do these things get. Speaking of how tall do things get, I got another question today. Somebody asked me about you know they're they're growing a food forest system in central florida and they had a lot of trees that are already there what do they do with the trees that are already there there's a lot of invasive stuff there's a lot of trees there's a lot of vines should we just bush hog it all and now you know my answer on that because i've i've talked about it in, in previous good streams no don't bush hog it all use it as a resource to feed to the other trees you know chop them chop them down and feed them to the other trees but you may want to leave some trees in the canopy that are already existing on the land. For example, in my North Florida food forest, I had a few oaks. And I said, I'm just gonna leave these oaks. I don't mind the oaks being here. There's a couple of oaks up there, but it's something for the squirrels to do, you know? And over there, oh, one side of the yard, there's a magnolia tree. Magnolia doesn't have anything I can eat on it, but the kids like to climb it. It was the climbing tree. So I left the magnolia. I just plant it into the canopy. I, 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 you know, pace off as far as I want to go to plant the next big tree from the magnolia. Cool. It works. Just leave it. You don't have to cut down every single tree. You know, if you've got existing trees, there's plenty of uses for those trees. The trees actually help moderate the environment around them. They keep the, the frost from being as big a deal. They provide you some shade as you're working on the system. They drop a lot of leaves. I remember my friend, um, Chet, who ran the, the website, theprepperproject.com, talking about how much he loved his maple trees. He's like, I don't, I don't tap those trees. I don't, there's nothing I can eat off of those trees. He says, but they give me so many leaves that I can use for compost, it's ridiculous. I love them because they break down fast. So you look at it and say, it's a resource. I look at my lawn as a resource. Whatever bit of lawn that I have, right now, the only lawn that I have is the grass road, the access road running down along the side of my house. So I, you know, actually I have the kids, the kids cut it with a string trimmer and they rake it up and then we have big piles of grass that I can use in the compost pile or use for mulch. It's great, it's a resource. So if you have an existing tree, it's like, well, do I really need that space? Or would I be happy with that 40 year old maple tree right there? Is that a good place to hang a tire swing? Is that a good place for a tree fort? Hey, if it's making a lot of uh, making a lot of fodder for the compost, is a good place to plant a couple of shade plants. Maybe I want to put a couple of pawpaws around it. Pawpaws like some shade. Maybe it's a good place to start a community of other plants around it. You know, so you look at the existing trees and say, well, they can be part of the canopy. You know, you don't have to start from scratch. Or you might say, well, I, I need that space for something else. But even then, if that tree is there, you don't have to destroy it. You could coppice it. A lot of trees, if you cut them down with a chainsaw, right to the ground, 
do this in the end of the winter before the sap starts to rise. Cut it right to the ground. There's so much vigor and strength left in those roots that when the spring comes, it'll start putting shoots up and you just let those shoots grow. It takes, it opens up a whole bunch of sunlight, but you haven't killed the tree. Now you've got multiple poles growing from the ground. When they reach like this big around, do the same thing in the winter, saw them down, cut these into pieces. Now you have perfect firewood. You know, the Europeans did this for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. There's still old coppice. It, it, it rejuvenates the tree and allows the tree to outlive its natural lifespan for some strange reason. Because you would think being chopped to the ground would, would shorten your lifespan, but it doesn't. These trees actually live a lot longer. But they grow the firewood. Rather than growing the firewood to this big around and then having to bust it all into little pieces, <laughs> they cut it down. Cut down, a, cut down an existing tree, it's maybe this big. When it grows back to the size that they want firewood at, they just cut that up. Chop, 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 chop. Now you have nice round logs that you can go season and throw in the firewood. Hey, use those existing trees. Don't just say, ah, forget it, I'm burning it. That's just a waste. You might as well use it. Use the recurring biomass. Even if you cut it down and you didn't use it for firewood, say it's a tropical tree, you cut it down and it regrows. You cut it down and it regrows. Every time you, you cut it down, don't kill it. Just chop parts of it. So you always leave some of it growing, and that way you can take the parts that you chop off, take that hard work, chop it up, use it for mulch around another tree. It'll feed the fungi, it'll mulch the ground, it'll feed the tree, it's awesome. So don't worry about those existing trees. And now finally, your canopy is going to vary according to the space you have. You guys saw the, the image that I had. Let me see if I can find it again here. <clears throat> I'm going to find this image and, and drop it in here. Uh, one second. All right, so right here, here's my little backyard food forest when it was very young in my parents' backyard. And I have another image of it too, which I used for the cover of this good stream. Here we go. I need to take that one out. We don't need that. All right. So right here, you can see we have a young system. There are fruit trees in here. Those of you who have seen the Great South Florida Food Forest Project on my last garden tour, back uh, the beginning of last year, I gave a talk there. Yeah, it doesn't look like this anymore. At this point, you can see the canopy is that candlestick cassia off to the left, and there's one of them over to the right with the yellow flowers. The sub canopy, there's a key lime in the front, slightly to the left, kind of that greenish shrub. And around it, there are cassava bushes growing. And then there are uh, you know, bananas as the top canopy, as well as papayas. This is very early on in the system. Now, the canopy is big mango, a big avocado, a big star fruit, a big mulberry, and then a smaller mulberry, and still a smaller, the, the key lime is still pretty small, it fits underneath. There's still some cassava in there, there's some nitrogen fixers in there. I'm going to get back there before too long, Lord willing, and then do some work on it for my mom. Clean some things out, make some of those layers work a little better and tighten them up. But, but the system has evolved over time. But you see, this is, not a, this is not a big yard. This is a small, a small space here. That's not huge. That's a little weeny food forest. It's barely, barely a food forest, right? but it's a scalable system. The canopy here is only 20 feet, maybe, maybe 16, more like 16 feet. Even right now, the top of the canopy is no more than 20 because we get in there and we prune moderately often. So in that backyard, if we were to let a mango grow to its full capacity, it would hit 60 feet. It would be insane. There would be one mango and there would be almost nothing else. Too much. 
so we have to go in and take that center out. But fortunately, mangoes do well when you prune them. No big deal. The other trees, you know, um, the mulberries respond very well to pruning. One of the mulberries is a dwarf. The star fruit has probably hit its peak. It's hit its height. And star fruit's not a tall tree. It's maybe 16 feet. You know, no big deal. That's easy to maintain in a small space. But, but you wouldn't go and plant a mammy sapote and a jackfruit in there because they would just fill the whole thing up. Like if you wanted a mammy sapote and a jackfruit, plant them on opposite ends of the yard and just plan that you're not gonna have much else in between because that's just what you got. <laughs> Something like that that's gonna get 60 feet or 80 feet or whatever, forget it. You know, so if you've got a small yard or small space, it doesn't mean you can't have a food forest. It means what you have to do is say, okay, my canopy would be the sub canopy type trees, the shorter trees, that's my canopy. And then my sub canopy then becomes shrubs. You know, your, your Suriname cherries or your further north Nanking cherry you know, thornless blackberries. Those shrubs are your sub canopy. Your canopy up north for a shorter system might be some pruned apples, plums, peaches, you know, pears. That might be your canopy. You're probably not gonna put pecans in a yard that has, you know, 5,000 square feet. It's too small. It's, it's just gonna, it's gonna cover the whole system and then it's over, you know. So, so don't worry about it. Don't worry about, you know, oh shoot, you know, how am I gonna grow these giant trees? Just, just don't grow the giant trees. Plant smaller trees instead and say, that's my canopy. Look at the pattern. Look at the pattern of food forest layers from temperate climate permaculture. By the way, if you, look, I love this guy. I have linked to his articles multiple times. He's a really sharp dude. So for colder climate, tcpermaculture.com. I totally ripped off his image but he probably is not gonna care because I'm sending traffic his way and I like him. Um, good guy. So, you know, look at that top layer. That it, it doesn't, that could be, number one layer there could be a 20 foot tree or a 15 foot tree. Heck, you know, if you have a really tiny space, like a patio, you could make a dwarf banana be your canopy layer. What, eight feet? You know, eight feet? Around it, plant some Mysore raspberries. There's your sub-canopy. You, know, you, you don't have to be like, oh, I don't have space for it, you know. You, you can make it work. You just scale it down. Just go smaller. You could do this with containers if you wanted to. One big potted tree, smaller potted shrubs around it. You know, no big deal. But in the future um, videos, we'll talk about some of the, you know, the sub-canopy and the vines and other bits and pieces. So... Um, I am going to answer Super Chat questions now. And uh, I hope that was helpful. Kind of a, just an overview of the canopy layer. And of course, if you're interested more in food forest and that kind of stuff, my, my website, thesurvivalgardener.com, has a lot of in, insight on that, as does um, TC Permaculture has some good stuff. And, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of resources. If you can get a copy of Jeff Lawton's establishing a food forest the permaculture way it will give you an overview of it though it's not exactly the way i would do it and it's not the way you would probably do it necessarily in a uh, temperate system so first of all cactus eater bear sends a super chat and says the forest behind my house has wild blackberries very few blackberries this year how can we maximize what's already there this is, this is kind of fun. It's sort of a, a guerrilla gardening kind of thing. If you're, if you're going on walks regularly and you see a particularly nice patch of say elderberries, blackberries, you find a nice persimmon tree or whatever. I have done this. I, I'll, I'll go out there and I'll chop down some of the brush around it, take some of the vines off it, I may even go out there surreptitiously, you know, with some, uh, some bone meal and blood meal or whatever else, you know, uh, go pee on it. I mean, like, just find a way to, you know, say, okay, 
these are good and these aren't so good. This area, you know, most of the blackberries are really thorny and nasty and they only have tiny little blackberries. Well, you, you can get a chance to go out there and chop down the ones that are, are, are lousy and then throw all the prunings to the ones that are good. You've just taken their hard work and fed it to the other one. And I, I have also found really, really, really good blackberries in the wild. On, a, on one occasion, I found some really good thorny blackberries growing wild in Florida and while I was hiking this big swampy area with somebody. And I have no idea where it was now. I could probably never find those blackberries again. But I so wish when I was out there, I had taken some cuttings or dug up one of the, one of the side shoots of that thing and brought it home because it was a really good wild blackberry, nice fruit, very productive. And I said, wow, this thing is ideally suited to Florida. And I didn't grab it, but I should have because you know, genetic diversity is pretty incredible in plants. You can, you can, you know, if you find something in the woods that's really amazing, propagate it. Take it home and graft it onto something or plant it or plant the seeds or whatever else or start cuttings, you know. Cuttings is the surest way usually for grafting. But, uh, you know, if you've got a forest back there, if you can make sure that those blackberries get some sunshine, that's important. Make sure they don't get run over by other stuff. And, you know, if you want to go, go bring them some coffee grounds. <laughs> Gather some pine needles, mulch around the base. That, that'll help. They like the acidity. They like a little extra nitrogen. Go out, go out there and pour a little fish emulsion water on them sometime. You know, early in the spring. You know where they are. Go pour some fish emulsion on them. You'll probably get a lot of berries. Uh, Carolyn sends a $5 super chat. It says, thank you for good information. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Much appreciated. You're a natural encourager. <laughs> Beach Bear sends a super chat and says, I started some plants from seeds. Just stuck them in the ground. I now have a Delonyx Regia baby next to two Moringa babies. Can I move them? Small yard. Yes, you can move them. They will probably live. Both of those usually transplant pretty well, but I would wait for those Moringa to... If, if, okay, if they're still green and small and you can get a big scoop of dirt underneath them and move them and then water them, but don't drown them, they'll probably live. The Delonyx Regia is probably almost certainly gonna live. Just dig it up and move it and keep it watered. But Moringa is subject to, to getting damaged and dying really easily when they're very small. So if you wait until they have a little bit of a woody stem, let them get a little taller, a couple of feet or whatever, till their stem starts to get woody, they generally will survive transplanting better. But they, they will lose their leaves and it'll look sad for a little while, but they should come back. So. Yeah, sticking seeds in the ground is the way to do it, Beach Bear. That's cool. Let me see if I got any more. Uh, let's see. Hey, Skippy. Let me find any more questions here. I think that's it for the Super Chats. Yes. <clears throat> Lorifel says, we tried to make pepper plants the canopy, but the other plants outgrew them. Yeah, you need bigger peppers. <gasps> Caveman Smash says, I have an old starfruit tree with struggling leaves and some rotten branches. Anything I can do to help this old timer? Yeah, prune it back. Prune it back and let it regrow. Uh, starfruit will often grow blooms like almost right again after it's pruned. I actually took a video of a starfruit that had been cut back and it had blooms like coming out of the trunk right after it was cut. I mean nasty recent cuts with a machete and the thing was growing back and blooming. So I would, I would prune it to reinvigorate it, throw, um, throw some mulch around it, you know, throw some compost around it. Yeah, I, I would just prune it back. If you kill it, well, you plant another one. If it's still struggling and it's rotten, you know, take out all the rotten branches you can. Uh, you're generally not going to not going to kill a starfruit tree unless it's, it's on its way out anyways. <clears throat> I've pruned starfruit heavily and had it come back just fine. Let's see here. Eric Matt says, I began developing a four acre food forest. Two years ago in southeast Kansas, 
and it is going well except for the armadillo that continues to terrorize it every night no matter what you do. I'll tell you what the armadillos do. The armadillos are often hunting for white grubs and slugs and snails. But they will go and they'll eat the white grubs. That's the little beetle grubs, like June bug grubs. The, the, white, the white grubs tend to get into the roots of plants and they're, they're chewing and doing damage beneath the surface and the armadillos love to dig them up. I, I had a lot of my pots in my nursery knocked over night after night after night until I finally figured out it was an armadillo and not a poltergeist. Um, but I, as long as the armadillo is not killing the trees, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I, I find them... Un, they're borderline beneficial. <laughs> you know. Let's see. Yeah, if Arch Enema decides to leave, there will be nobody for Rayaboth Farm to play off of. So I, I hope that doesn't happen. Guys, the guy, the bounce. We missed the bounce. Uh, Treasure Coast Homesteader says, I got 20 banana trees from one tree and 10 papayas from one fruit. Right now, propagating longevity spinach with great success. Good work. All, all good ones. Easy to start, too. <clears throat> Eric says, sweet potatoes and more, as well as vegetable gardens, which I give the produce to the local food pantry. It's the joy of my life. That's a good place to find joy. As a matter of fact, when you are miserable, one of the best things you can do is just serve somebody else. I was, I was pretty downcast the other day, dealing with paperwork, struggling, 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 grinding bureaucracy. And uh, I said, you know what? I need a break. So what, I, I could lay around all day and read P.G. Wodehouse and smoke my pipe and drink rum and coke. But I'm better served by going and helping somebody else. So a friend of mine was struggling trying to get his, uh, his boat fixed. And so I just, I just said, listen, I know that you're really having a hard time getting all this stuff done. Can I just come help you? And he was like, yes. <laughs> so I went over and worked on his boat for a few days. I'll tell you, that was so much more enjoyable than doing paperwork or even sitting around drinking rum and reading P.G. Wodehouse. And I like P.G. Wodehouse. But I can drink rum in the evening and read P.G. Wodehouse if I want to. <clears throat> Just go find somebody else to invest in, you know? Go give the food away. One of the great things about having a food forest, people are like, what would I do with all that fruit? Well, you don't have to eat it all. Give it away. Give it away. Just give it away. It's fun. All right, let's see. I'm Irish, so kiss me. Says, I'm in zone 7B, so I can't grow tropical plants in my backyard. Um, yes, no, I understand that. But the, the food forest system will work whether or not you are dealing with tropical or temperate. It's just a different, you just pick a different set of species. The design of the forest is very similar in temperate and tropical. Just different species. It's okay. <clears throat> Hey, Karen. Karen is getting made a moderator as well. Guess what, Karen? You're now a moderator. <laughs> Taylor says, my backyard is one big science experiment. You are my kind of gardener. Good work. Ev says, help, how do I moderate? Okay, if you see somebody, there's uh, alongside a chat, somebody, something's getting weird, um, you can just, you can click the three dots to the right and it will allow you to moderate. You should be able to figure it out, I think. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Okay, okay, Arch, I'll find you. All right, 
so, where are we? Any more, any more? <laughs> Beach Bear says, yeah, my impulse lychee just cost me 40 bucks. I understand impulse lychees, Beach Bear. Other than pecan, what is a good canopy tree for 9B? Uh, if you can get a good honey locust, like the type that makes good sweet pods, that's a good one. Uh, the pears can be a canopy tree. Uh, American persimmon is a good one. Uh, Dunstan chestnut is a good one. <clears throat> yeah, I need a shirt that says most things in life can be fixed with a chainsaw. As soon as I do it, it will immediately get ripped off. Um, by, uh, by, by bots on Amazon, like my Compost Your Enemy shirts. They're only Compost Your Enemy shirts if they're from Aardvark screen printing. I, I made it. It supports a small business, uh, both them and me. Uh, but it got ripped off by, like, Chinese bots, and now it's on all these t-shirt companies and stuff with all their own versions of Compost Your Enemies. It always happens. I'll do it eventually. I should do it. Good idea. Most things in life can be fixed with a chainsaw. Let's see here. Black walnut lumber is economically significant. Yes, I, I remember reading um, somebody about 10 years ago saying, you know what? Black walnut is a better investment than the stock market. <laughs> Long term. <clears throat> Pine needles are a good source, of, great source of vitamin C. Yes, I've made pine needle tea before. <laughs> Lisa says, "Hey David, why don't you use glass like windows and doors made of glass?" <laughs> Lisa, Lisa, in Massachusetts. Hey mom, nice to see you. <laughs> Hello from Robbie and Gary. Hello Robbie and Gary. Hey, Deb, Central Washington. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this thing because I have another video that needs to get posted. So what I'm going to do is do a premiere of the new video in just a little bit. I think you guys will enjoy it. Before that, I have to do my obligatory plug for unauthorized.tv. You know, the other day we had this thing where uh, where one of my videos disappeared from here. It was like some sort of a bot action where I was like, what the heck did I say that it says, your video contains harmful and dangerous content. So I have a backup. <clears throat> I love all of you at YouTube. YouTube, it's nothing personal. <laughs> it's nothing personal. But I do have a backup at unauthorized.tv and I also have other videos over there like my home building videos and stuff that I don't put out for a huge audience. Uh, but unauthorized.tv is subscriber only. It's five bucks a month. And it's getting better all the time. We, we, we are up to good stream. What good stream are we up to? Um, I can't remember, but on the server, so I'm going to see it up to 100. We should have good streams up to 100 very shortly. They're already on the server. They just have to be sorted. So the good streams up to 100 will be on here very soon at unauthorized.tv, along with my house building videos and my food forest tour, the big, big food talks that I gave. One of them was at Carolyn's house up in Gainesville on Florida gardening. The other one was the tour of my South Florida food forest project. That's all on there. Thank you for those of you who have borne with me through the difficulties of getting unauthorized.tv to work properly because it is a complicated thing to launch a video site. And I got in at the ground floor uh, Wrangler Star is over there too, and uh, comedian Owen Benjamin is over there, and there's some other interesting people that are on there too. So it's a brand new video site, but it's only subscriber only. So it's this is the backup. <clears throat> MW Nemo sends a super chat, super chat for the dangerous content. So I thank you. Um, hey Chase, thank you. It was fun being on with Owen. Up from Zone 10, Suncal. So, I do not recommend trying to fix your drinking problem with a chainsaw. 
It depends on where you point the blade, honestly. William says, speaking of Lowe's, all of their fruit trees are half off right now. So, hey, guys. Lowe's fruit trees half off. This video has been sponsored by Lowe's. Lowe's. PJ Donatelli says, yep, Zone 5 here and realized after watching permaculture and food forest shows, I actually have one. Good work. I love that. Sha Shaquila says, what type of pears for human areas? Uh, sand pear varieties. Pineapple, Orient, Florida Home. Um, if you could find ones that are called sand pears, those are generally better in hot and humid climates. Uh, they do really well in North Florida. They should do well in your area too. <clears throat> That's funny. Haley M, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, I hope it was. I hope we had a good bit of useful information for you guys today. It's one of my favorite topics, and I thought let's just do a series. So in coming good streams, I will do more on the different layers of the food forest, and. Um, I hope to see you guys there and as always you can find my books on Amazon there are links below this video to my books you can follow me on Instagram and like and subscribe and hit the bell and all that stuff and I, I'm got, I gotta play a, a final song for you let me let me see what can we play um,
to trust and obey. It's one of my old favorites. We used to sing that in church when I was a kid. Very simple song. Good old church song. <laughs> Hello, Rick. Hello from Atmore, Alabama. I've got some friends in Alabama. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. <clears throat> oh, that's cool. William says, my grandson and I cut open a homegrown yellow meat watermelon today. It was really good. There really is something about our Grand Bay, Alabama soil. Talking about Alabama, another friend in Alabama. It makes our melons great. That is cool. That's nothing better than that. You're in the garden with your grandson. God bless you. That's what I'll, that's, that's, that's a good piece of life right there. Thank you very much, M.W. Nemo, for the, the super chat. One more super chat for a great hymn to end the day. Well, um, God bless. I will catch you all later. Sometimes the best thing to do is to, well, always the best thing to do is just simply, if you know there's something you're supposed to do, trust and obey. Just do it. Just do it. If there's something that's eating at you that you know you should fix, just fix it. Life will be much, much better. Even if it's painful, even if it's like tearing off a scab, do it and heal, ask for forgiveness, and go past it. So, anyhow, uh, I'm no preacher, but uh, just this gardener, you know, I just had to share that. Anyhow, <laughs> I'll catch y'all later. And stay tuned because the premiere is coming up, and it's hilarious. Uh, I should have the premiere up probably at 7 o'clock Eastern. So I'll catch you there. And until then, may your thumbs always be green. <laughs>